So Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and to teach. I, I pray that you would raise us up as a people that are the fragrant aroma of Christ to this generation. And even though we will be the stench of death to some, Lord, we pray for grace to communicate your message by demonstrating compassion without compromising the truth. We just pray that you'll equip us in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, my name is Linda Seiler, and I am the uh, director of Purdue Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship, which is the Assemblies of God Outreach to the Secular University. At uh, I direct Chi Alpha at Purdue University. So we had a number of students that were able to come with us uh, to the conference, which is exciting. I have a picture of some of the students uh, in our group. And so I run into this as a campus pastor. I run into how do we communicate with the LGBT community when everybody thinks that if you're not for them and don't celebrate homosexuality, somehow you hate people. And that's not true, I love them, I've, I've come out of that background myself, so I have a, a tremendous compassion for them, but how do we demonstrate that in a way that they can receive it without compromising the truth, which is the dilemma we have. Before I jump into this today, I wanna to share with you one resource that is coming out in October. Joe Dallas wrote a book, and, and it's gonna be put out, I think, in October on Amazon. You can do a pre-order right now, called Speaking of Homosexuality, and how to uh, express the truth with kindness and clarity. It's gonna be an excellent, excellent book. I highly recommend you get on Amazon and pre-order it. It's gonna help you in having these conversations uh, with people in a post-Christian culture. But one of the things you need to understand is that uh, when you are out there speaking to people in the gay community is that they don't know your heart and they are going to make some assumptions about you, especially if they don't come from any kind of a Christian background or maybe some of them did but really got hurt by the church. There are assumptions that as soon as you say the word Christian, they automatically make about you. And I discovered this when I was doing some research at Purdue University. I was talking to the LGBT director there. I asked him if I could interview some of his student leaders for some of my research. I'm working on my PhD right now at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. And he graciously allowed me to interview their students, very articulate, wonderful people, wonderful human beings. And uh, as I was interviewing them, I was asking the Holy Spirit, what, how do I start this conversation with these people? Because they know I'm a pastor, they know I'm a Christian, they know in their mind I represent everything that you know, is, is the diametric opposite of them. And the Holy Spirit said this, uh, you need to recognize that when you go to speak with these people, this is who they think you are. They think you are Westboro Baptist Church and that you're gonna hold up these nasty picket signs of God hates fags, and fags die, God laughs. That's not the heart of God at all. But it's, it's the most vocal uh, protesters like this that have done the most damage to the kingdom of God and to the cause of Christ. And, and these people obviously are a stench of death in the nostrils of, of unbelievers, and it's, it's the stench of death in my nostrils too. This is not the heart of God whatsoever. But we have to distance ourselves from these people and say, hey, I'm not coming in that heart and coming in that spirit. I don't know if you've ever looked up the Westboro Baptist Church website, but this is their website address literally is godhatesfags.org or .com, one of them. And then this is one of the statements they say on their website. God hates fags is a profound theological statement which the world needs to hear more than it needs oxygen, water, and bread. I know none of us in, in this room feel that way, but you have to understand this is what the gay community thinks of when they think of you, when they think of a Christian. And so we're, before you even open your mouth, if you even identify as a Christian, they automatically lump you into this group. Be it, be it right or wrong, they lump you in there. So that's something we have to be aware of. There's this obstacle before we even engage with people from the gay community. So I encounter this all the time at the Purdue campus. We have these nasty protesters who come and they show these signs. You may not be able to read the writing very well on the slide behind me, but it, this says, uh, warning to all fornicators, adulterers, lesbians, sodomites, and it just lists a bunch of sins. And, and at the end, it lists non-Christians. And it says, be sure your sin will find you out. And you know, a nasty picket sign like that does not make me want to draw near to Jesus. I don't know about you. 
but th that this is not the heart of God at all. And yet they come to our campus, they post these wicked protests, and then anybody that walks past them, they will accuse people they don't even know. If a girl is wearing shorts and maybe a sleeveless shirt or something, she may be a believer standing in the crowd, and they'll call her out and call her a whore. They don't even know her. And then they'll make derogatory comments about all you homosexuals out there and how God hates them and all of that. And so we're up against that on our own campus where the gay community thinks this is who I am if I'm a Christian that I identify with them, and we don't. You even see this now. Um, I was out in the Northeast, and there's a bunch of United Church of Christ churches out there, and they have these flags on the front of their church that says, God is still speaking. All you silly people who think the Bible is the word of God and you hold fast to that. No, he's still speaking, and we need to update the Bible to be current with 2016, and he's changed his mind now on sexuality. That's not true, but this is, this is the atmosphere where we're in. We're definitely in a post-Christian atmosphere where at one point, Christians used to be the majority in the United States. I mean, our country was founded for the free practice of religion, right? And now, that, that's not the case. You, you don't have the freedom to practice your religion without being persecuted. And so, <clears throat> how do we respond then, the winning question of the day, how do we respond in a culture where same-sex marriage is now legal and anyone who disagrees with homosexuality is labeled a bigot? This is the dilemma, this is the catch-22 that we're in. How do we demonstrate compassion without compromising the truth? And I thought Andrew did a great job in that first session of talking about how we must hold fast to the word. We're not going to concede. Uh, but there, there's strategy. We have to recognize if we're not going to see, concede, how do we go about sharing the truth in a way people could receive it? Not everybody is going to receive it. We are going to be hated. And you just got to be prepared for that. But there are going to be some that come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that hear, when they hear the truth, it, it bears witness with them. And they come to know Jesus as a result. We must not be quiet in the face of persecution, but we must be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And so before we jump into this, I'm going to give you 10 tips on engaging with the LGBT community. But before we jump into those tips, I need to share with you just like a brief history lesson of how we ended up today in a post-Christian culture or uh, post-modern thought is what it's called. You have pre-modern, modern, and post-modernism. We're in, we're in the period of time where post-moderns or millennials think a certain way that most of us in this room don't think. So we have to get inside their brains and see how they process truth so that we can package the truth in a way that they can receive it. So with pre-modern, post-modern thinking, in the histories, history, before the 1600s, everybody thought, you know, God was the source of everything, his word is truth, and there was just this, in the West anyway, just a general understanding and a fear of God, a reverence of God. Most people were believers and Christians, and that's just the way we oriented to, to life, that God is the author of all human dignity and morality and, and truth. And in the 1600s, and you move into the, the age of enlightenment and Rene Descartes, the, that famous philosopher uh, who was he was disillusioned with the Catholic Church, and so he goes on this skeptical voyage to seek his own truth, and this is what he comes up with, I think, therefore I am. You've heard that before, right? And the whole premise is, it's dethroning God as the author of truth and the author of all morality, the author of human dignity. It's dethroning God, and it's placing self on the throne and saying, I'm, I'm the center here. Human beings and their own intelligence are going to be the answer to every problem on earth. We are going to improve the human condition on the planet. We don't need to look to God anymore. And so this modern way of thinking was really dependent on human beings as being the ultimate authority in the universe, not God. And we came up with things like the scientific method. We're going to explain everything away. We're going to analyze it, have hypotheses. And we're, we are going to explain how the universe works because we're super smart and we are the center of the universe. This is modern thinking. And then, so all this kind of reigned for a period of time. And then, in the last century, guess what happened that proved that human beings and their intellect will not solve all of the world problems. Anybody know what happened? World War I and World War II. Things did not get any better. They got worse. And then this sense of disillusionment 
and hopelessness set in. It's like, wait a minute. Our own intellect, we did not solve all the problems of the world. And in all of our absolutist thinking, the scientific method, and I think therefore I am, and we've got a reason for everything, we can explain it all, we can't. And we actually do need God, but instead of it driving us to God, it drove us away from God and made us even more skeptical of God and humanity. And so enter in the 1960s, postmodernism. Postmodernism is a knee-jerk reaction to modernistic thought. And this is how postmoderns think. Four things. They despise authority. Anything that has to do with an absolute authority, no, I'm going to rule my own life, thank you very much, not someone or something else. Secondly, they reject any form of absolute truth. If you tell me you understand how everything works, I don't believe you. There is a skepticism there, and I will not receive absolute truth. Everything's relative. What may be good for you is good for you, but what's good for me is good for me. If it feels good, do it. There's no sense of absolute truth. Third thing, they elevate experience over reason. So where I think, therefore, I am, the reasoning, brain, intellectual mind, no more. No more. Scrap that. Now it's human experience. Whatever feels good, do it. Subjective truth trumps objective truth for the postmodern person. And then lastly, they are very much into social justice. Because they saw the dangers and the, the perils of imperialism, colonialism, entire cultures being snuffed out and being replaced by what we thought was the better Western way, and we've proven it wasn't. And they're, they're mad about that. There's a knee-jerk reaction to it. So they, they, very, they have this strong sense of justice and sticking up for those that have been oppressed by this absolute authority and, and by this concept of absolute truth. Okay, so that's how your typical postmodern thinks. And this is true, not of the majority of us in this room. Most of you guys are probably, you know, 30s, 40s, and, and even older. I'm talking about people in their 20s and younger, and early 30s, 20s, and younger. That's how the, this millennial generation thinks. And you can see how in the context of this thinking, homosexuality could become popular and accepted. All the things you're seeing in our culture right now, it's like, oh, that makes sense. So here we come now as Christians, and this is the way most Christians think, not all, but most Christians think this way. We believe God is the highest authority in the universe. There is authority, and authority is good. No authority exists except the, that which God has established, Romans 13. We also believe that the Bible is absolute truth, that it is the holy word of God, and he calls the shots. We don't. We don't get to rewrite it. We don't get to revise it. The, God, the word of God is the highest truth in the universe. Third, we elevate the word of God over our experience. We believe what the word says, even though currently it may not be what I'm experiencing and feeling. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's not my experience every single day. There are times I do not respond the way Jesus responds. There are times I'm, I'm taken by temptation or anger or rage or you know, whatever in ways that don't reflect the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in me. It's not necessarily my, my moment by moment experience, but scripture says that Jesus lives in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And that day by day, he's sanctifying me and making, conforming me more to the image of Christ every single day. Uh, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 talks about, you were, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The postmodern doesn't, that just doesn't compute with one who elevates experience over reality, over the word of God, over objective truth. But the word of God says, I am to be renewed in my mind. And if there are things, temptations, homosexual temptations, whatever that I'm experiencing, those are my deceitful desires that are being corrupted. And that, that's not who I really am in Christ. And my mind needs to be re renewed, and I need to begin living out of the new self, not embracing the old self and then labeling myself by it. Well, I'm a gay Christian. No, 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 no. We don't do that for any other sin. I'm an adulterous Christian. I'm a lying Christian. Right? Well, I can't help it. It's just my orientation. I have to lie. No. Well, we need to make space in the church for lying Christians. No. No. That's not congruent with the message of the gospel. Right? 
Okay, so here we come as Christians, we elevate objective truth, the word, over subjective truth, experience. And then lastly, a lot of Christians have this mindset, we're not really concerned about social justice issues because it's like, hey, Jesus is coming and we're going to escape to heaven. I'm not saying that's a positive thing, okay? But the most Christians think that way. We should have a holistic gospel that cares not just about the life to come, but the people on this planet now. And we want to see God's kingdom come and his will be done and live lives that demand a gospel explanation and draw people to the truth. And so the way we serve others through social justice and compassion demonstrates the good news of the gospel. But for the most part, a lot of Christians aren't concerned about social justice issues. And so the postmodern looks at us and goes, you're an alien. You're a foreigner. You, you do not speak my language. You're living in a world that is not reality for the millennial or for the post-Christian postmodern. So this is our challenge. And a lot of Christians look at this and go, oh, woe is me. This is the worst hour for the church. It's just becoming darker and darker. And we get hopeless and disillusioned. I'm telling you what, friends, this is the greatest hour for the church. Church. The darker it gets, the brighter we're going to shine. And you know what? Your understanding of the gospel is going to deepen as you are forced to contextualize the gospel in a way that postmoderns can receive it. It'll get deeper in you. You'll have a fuller appreciation for the love of Jesus, what he's done for you, what he's done for others. But unfortunately, much of the church has syncretized the gospel instead of contextualizing the gospel. And so you see syncretism seeping into the church where God is not the highest authority anymore. We're revising the scriptures. We're saying things like you can be gay, be a gay Christian and we have to make place for celibate gay Christians. I'm not saying that we should be celibate, right? We shouldn't act out. And, and there are people that struggle with temptation and all that stuff still. We got to walk people through that. But transformation is possible. Change is possible, as Andrew was just talking in the previous session. And yet we see syncretism seeping into the church. Even in our worship songs, it wasn't true today, but in, in many churches where you go, a lot of the worship songs aren't even focused on God himself. They're very experiential. They're very subjective. It's, it's what God does to me and how I feel about th this experience with God. And that's not wrong. We should have an experiential relationship with God. It's not just a head relationship. But you know, have you ever been in a meeting where like you're worshiping and like the presence of God comes and he rests as you're worshiping? It's typically not on the songs where you're singing about yourself and what the gospel, you know, how Jesus is impacting you. It's usually on the songs where Jesus is being lifted up and you and I fade into the background and we just focus on who he is and how marvelous his character is, and the presence of God comes. It's amazing, right? But there's a syncretism that's crept into the church where self is on the throne, and we've de we're despising the authority of God's word, experience trumps objective truth, and all of that. So all of that is a background to help us launch into 10 tips for reaching uh, the LGBT community, to engage with them. And I'm using the, that word intentionally, engaging with them, not you're the, the target and I'm trying to reach that target and I'm aiming for the target. We, we have to engage and dialogue with them. The first thing is you need to recognize that this is a battle in the spirit realm. And Andrew was mentioning that this morning, a yes and amen to everything that he was saying. This massive cultural shift that we have just experienced is not something that has just happened in the natural. This is being energized by demonic strongholds. I've never seen anything go so fast, not just with the gay marriage stuff, now the transgender push, it's going even faster than the gay marriage stuff did. I mean, we, you look at our culture where we were 10 years ago in 2006, we are nowhere near where we were to, in 2006. What accounts for that? It's being energized by demonic strongholds. We have to recognize that as the body of Christ because you cannot win a fight in the battle by using natural weapons, right? right? So we have to recognize that. Ephesians 6.12 talks about how our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And you see this manifest, not just in what we see in culture, but in the subtle ways the enemy kind of stages his, uh, his move and what's going on. On college campuses and in a lot of high schools, they have these things called safe zones. Have you heard of that? Where you have to create a safe zone where anybody that is gay identified can be gay and out and proud. And we not only affirm them, we will celebrate with them. What used to be a perversion is now turned into a celebration in our culture. And so now we have these safe zones, and if you are a friend of somebody in the LGBT community, you are known as an ally. 
Now, I want you to think of this terminology, a safe zone and an ally. Where else do you see these terms used in the context of war, right? This is just a subtle reminder. We are in a battle, and it's not in the natural realm. It is in the spirit realm. And so you have to fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. You need to remember that the enemy is the enemy, not the gay-identified person. And it's not the liberal media and the people that persecute us. The enemy is the enemy. God loves every single human being, even the ones that hate us and persecute us. And we are to love them and see them, respect them as human beings made in the image of God, the same way God loves us. And to recognize there are spiritual forces that are energizing the things that are coming against us. Don't hate the people. Direct your aggression at the stronghold in prayer, not at the human beings. Otherwise, you will ostracize them and they won't hear a word that you're saying. Secondly, apologize for how Jesus has been misrepresented to the gay community. That's what happened when I went to interview those students on campus. The Holy Spirit said, Linda, the first words out of your mouth need to be, I am so sorry for how Jesus has been misrepresented to you. And I want to let you know, I am not coming in the spirit of the Westboro Baptist Church. Any chance I have, I distance myself from those preachers on campus or anybody that's misrepresenting the gospel. And I I make it a point to let people know, I don't agree with that. And I believe that that is wrong. And I am so sorry that there are hurtful, hateful people out there. That that must be so demoralizing and dehumanizing to you. And I am so sorry. And I want to let you know that is not the heart of Jesus. And that's not my heart. Number three, avoid cliches. Like, you know, well, you know, in the beginning it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Not helpful. (laughs) Not helpful at all patronizing, trite, and it it really makes you come across in a way that they don't want to be your friend. You'd also be careful of saying things like, love the sinner, hate the sin. Because our sexuality is such an intimate thing, it's so closely tied to our identity, that when a gay person hears you say, oh, we love the sinner, we just hate the sin, all they hear you say is, you hate me. Because they are so one with their sin, they don't know how to separate themselves from that. And it's, it, the concept is still true. We love them, not the homosexual practice that they're acting on. We, we agree that it's morally wrong. But we have to find other ways to phrase that without using those catchy colloquialisms like that. Thirdly, uh, saying things like the gay lifestyle. I, I know we say that a lot. We use it. Uh, the reality is among, among gay-identified people, in a room like this, we can say that. We all know what we mean. When you're talking to gay-identified people, that can be really offensive, because what is the gay lifestyle? I, I have friends that are gay that like, don't even have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They're just, just a single old, I, I know a guy on campus, he's just a single man, and, and, but he's gay and out and, and proud about that, but he doesn't have a boyfriend and lives some kind of a lifestyle. You know? And then I know others that live a promiscuous lifestyle, others that are married, whatever. There, there's no, I mean, what's the heterosexual lifestyle? Right, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a single celibate Christian, but that's not true of every Christian. Uh, you know. Uh, that's heterosexual. So anyway, we have to be careful about using that terminology. Or saying things like, if, it's gay, it's, if you're gay, it's your choice. Nobody chooses to experience same-sex attractions. In, in my case, that was not something. I, I've never heard a junior hire go, oh, I'm, yay, I'm gay. I'm so happy I discovered I'm gay. You know, That's just not a situation that's, that's reality. So we have to be careful about that. And then lastly, in, in training your people and ourselves, no gay bashing jokes. We had a student at Purdue University who, when I was doing a panel, raised his hand and said, is Purdue Chi Alpha a safe place for gay-identified people? And I said, you know, is, is that a place where somebody can process their sexuality and still be a part of your community? I, I said, well, you know what, what our stance is regarding, we don't believe it's, it's morally okay to practice homosexuality, but if you struggle with those things, this is a safe family to be a part of, to, to walk your struggle out, to work it out. And the reason the student asked that, he ended up coming, being, coming and being a part of our group. The reason he asked it was because he was at another group, Christian group at Purdue University, and he was same-sex attracted. And he was getting ready to tell his small group Bible study. And so he comes to that, that Bible study that night, and he th- he's like, I know these guys well enough. I think I'm going to tell them tonight. And during the icebreaker time, the guys were joking around, and somebody just made some kind of passing joke, kind of a, a making fun of people that are gay. And that student decided, oh... I guess this isn't a safe place for me to confess that. I don't want to be made fun of. So we have to be very careful. You don't know who's in the room. Even around all Christians, even here, 
you don't know who's in the room and what they're struggling with and how hurtful that can come across when you say derogatory things about gay people. Okay, number four, defend LGBT people when it is appropriate to do so. When they are, example, the Orlando thing that just happened. We are not going to join in that and say, oh, this is a really good thing that happened. No, it's not. Some of you may have seen the pastor on YouTube that said, oh, this was, you know, a favor to society. And if I could, I'd line all the gays up against the wall and shoot them all. And I mean, it was horrible what he said. His video got taken off YouTube. But it, it got on CBS and ABC and NBC and, and all these people. And some of our non-Christian friends at Purdue were asking us, wait, is this, is this what you believe? Is this what Chi Alpha represents? And we said, no. And so I actually, I rarely post things on Facebook because I am friends with those that are part of the LGBT community, whatever. I'm trying to be strategic, wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. And I let Facebook be like social and I talk about my cat or a good hair day or something like that. But I, I don't normally talk about, you know, really intense issues. I want to have those conversations face to face. But when this happened, I posted on my Facebook page and I said, look, this is, a, this is not a favor to society. This is a grievous act that should never be repeated. And in fact, it would be a favor to society if this man had his ministry credentials revoked and could no longer represent Jesus in this way because it's a misrepresentation of the gospel. I was irate, and so I just posted that on Facebook and sent it out there. And, and you know, in that sense, I was, I was defending the people at that nightclub. This was not a favor to God or, or to those people. So when it's appropriate to do so, we ought to. That, that whole social justice thing with postmoderns, we need to stand up for social justice and speak out when it is appropriate to do so. Next, number five, engage in dialogue, not, not didactic monologue. You, you want to have a conversation with people, not preaching at them or talking at them, but in asking lots of questions. There are a lot of Christians who, while they believe that God wants to reach the gay community, they don't even have a single gay friend. But you're surrounded by people that you know that are coworkers or people in your neighborhood or even family members that you know are gay identified. And we ought to be people that initiate relationship with them. Don't be afraid. Befriend them and ask lots of questions. Hey, tell me your story. Oh, you're married. Where'd you meet your partner? That, that's not, you're not con condoning homosexuality by asking questions about them and getting to know them. Engage in a conversation. Engage in dialogue. Get to know their heart. And for us, uh, engaging in dialogue on campus means even the way we do outreach things. People say all the time, well, as a campus missionary, how do you reach the gay community? We don't necessarily do things explicitly to reach the gay community. We want to engage in dialogue because that's what postmoderns respond to. And so we're not going to like host this big thing where I just, you know, here's all the things the Bible says of why homosexuality is wrong and invite all the gay people to come listen. That's just really not going to go over well. Okay. But I don't shy away from preaching it. I do preach. I preached a message this last semester for our own people on gender and sexuality and homosexuality and all that. Because our, our, our students need to be grounded in the word and know what the word says and why we believe what we believe. But when we're doing outreaches, we do things that are more engaging in dialogue. So this fall, we're going to do a religious panel called Homosexuality and the Image of God, exploring the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith perspectives. We've invited the uh, Muslim leader, the Halal Jewish leader, myself, and then the Wesley leader, who's totally pro-gay, the Wesley Methodist group, and we're gonna share those four perspectives, and then each, uh, each share, and we open it up for Q&A afterwards, a dialogue kind of thing. I, I presented this to the LGBT director on our campus because I've gotten to know him. I've been to his office. We're friends. I see him in the hallway. We hug. And I love that. I feel the love of Jesus for him, even though I absolutely disagree. He knows my testimony. And when I shared it with him, he said, well, that's a narrative a lot of people don't want to hear. <laughs> and, I was, and I'm thinking to myself, well, your narrative is one a lot of people don't want to hear. So, uh, but anyway, he, he said, you know what? You can come to our, 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 our uh, LGBT info fair and advertise this panel. I was like, bring it on, you know? So we're just going to pray and fast and believe God that, that God will even bring those freshmen that come in that are kind of riding the fence that, you know, I don't know, I, I haven't come out of the closet, but maybe when I'm in college, I will and all of that. We're just praying that God will use that to redeem lives. But it's a dialogue. It's a discussion. It's not talking at them or preaching at them. The other thing we do is we have a, a God table on campus. We do a question of the day. And so this semester, we did one question, is it unloving? for somebody to believe a homosexual practice is morally wrong. We didn't say homosexuality, we said homosexual practice. 
to, to distinguish the practice from the person. And man, did we get some people who wanted to stop by our table and talk that day. But as they were talking with us and they heard our hearts, they heard our compassion, and they even heard my testimony, some of them, they said, where are you guys when those hateful preachers are out on campus? Like what you're sharing is really good. And I said, we're out there because I've been talking, every time those preachers are out, our students text and they say, they're on the engineering mall. And, okay, we go to the engineering mall and we try to counteract them and everything. But they were really receptive to the message, even though they disagreed with what we were saying. They said, but you're coming with such compassion. We really like that. Isn't that amazing? Now, not all of them loved us. Many people just, you know, spurned us and walked away in hate. But some were, I, I believe, genuinely convicted by the truth. Next one, six, address the intolerance of tolerance, <laughs> the irony of it all. The reality is we are battling a spirit of intolerance and intimidation, and even what Andrew said, that spirit of mockery of the Holy Spirit and the work that he can do to transform somebody's life. These are demonic entities that are energizing what's going on in our culture, and we have to recognize that. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 talks about how, for though you live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, one of the things that the Lord showed me in this scripture, one day I was, I was driving home, and it was when um, Spitzer, uh, this guy from the American Psychological Association, once had a, uh, something he published saying, Oh, man, you know, I've talked to gay people that really have experienced change. And, you know, I came to the conclusion, not only is change possible, if my own son were same-sex attracted, I would help him explore his heterosexual potential. Robert Spitzer came out and said that. And then, not even 10 years later, he comes out and says, just, I don't know, about three years ago, he said, I owe the gay community a huge apology. And his article was, his research was published in a journal, and the, the editor of the journal was like, oh, do you have new research to trump the old? Because, you know, that's the only way you can recant. And he said, oh, no, I don't have any new research. I just kind of changed my opinion. <laughs> and I was like, this is so illogical. There are things like that happening in our culture. We're like, we're looking at each other as Christians going, does anybody not see how illogical this is? The whole Target bathroom thing. Like, I just, I think a woman going to a woman's restroom just makes sense. I think a man going to a male restroom just makes sense. I think, you know, the transgender population, it's such a small minority in our population, and why are we trumping the majority of our population? But this makes no logical sense. And yet, this is what the Lord, I was, I was driving home one day, I'm like, Lord, I don't get it. Why, there's, it's so illogical, why does not everybody see it? And this is what the Lord said. He said, Linda, a stronghold, by definition, is something that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Arguments and pretensions that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You cannot oppose the God of truth and still operate in logic. Because truth and logic go hand in hand. And I was like, oh! So everybody that is under this demonic stronghold, they're not operating in logic. They've been duped. They've been veiled. They've been blinded by the enemy. This is what 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They can't see it. They literally can't see it. And we cannot shout loudly enough or argue logically enough to remove that blinder and that veil from their eyes. We need spiritual weapons. We need to cry out to our God and say, God, you are greater than the forces of darkness. Would you lift that veil? Would you open their eyes and help them to see? But I can't do it. Even my little picket sign and, you know, whatever, the things we do in the natural, yes, we just should take a bold stand in the natural, but we have to recognize the power comes from the Spirit. And it must be spiritually energized where God is behind it all and the, forces of his Holy, the force of his Holy Spirit is behind it all, not just natural actions alone. Those will be fruitless in the long run. But we need to realize, too, that whatever God is for, a stronghold by default is automatically against. So because you are for God and you are for truth, I don't care how compassionate you try to come across, and we should try to be compassionate. Don't mishear me. But I don't care how compassionate you are, there will always be people who hate you. Because a stronghold will always be opposed to God. So if you are representing God in his truth, Jesus said it this way. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it'd love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. 
That's why the world hates you. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. They hated Jesus. Why would you hate the most loving being in the universe who came to die for your sins? That's not logical. But when you're under a stronghold and you're influenced by the enemy and the deceitfulness of your own flesh, you're not going to see the truth. So we are losing this battle right now because we don't see the power there is in prayer. The church doesn't pray anymore. And I'm just, I'm vague, you know, large generalization here of the church in the West. Uh, we're really good at, you know, we love worship. We have lots of programs and Awanas and, you know, whatever. But like, where are the corporate prayer meetings? Where do we get together to pray and fast and seek God's face? That's where the power lies. And persecution ought to drive us to prayer, not just actions in the natural. It must be both. We can't just pray and not do anything in the natural and not say anything. It's got to be both and. I highly recommend D.A. Carson's book, The Intolerance of Tolerance. He, he does a wonderful job of dis, dissembling this uh, spirit of tolerance. And this is what he says. He says, under the old definition of tolerance, it used to be that there was objective truth, modern way of thinking, and that it's our duty to pursue truth. And under this modernistic thinking, Voltaire is quoted as saying, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That's true tolerance, right? We all have a seat at the table. I might not agree with you, but I don't hate you. I just, you know, I just disagree with you. We believe that in the free marketplace of ideas, if two opposing ideas hit, whatever's true is going to rise to the top. Truth will automatically do that. That's under the old definition of tolerance. That's a modern way of thinking. But postmoderns don't think that way, right? Because truth is not objective. It's subjective. It's experiential to them. And so under the new definition of tolerance, there is no objective or absolute truth, but rather all ideas must be equal because we hate the oppression that we saw with imperialism and colonialism, all that stuff, the injustices, we hate that. So everybody's got to be equal. And this is a problem because if all ideas are equal and I disagree with you, and you're, you're clearly wrong. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me, you're wrong if you believe anything else. I'm sorry, that's just what the Bible says. But if I can't say you're wrong because your idea has to be equal to my idea, then where is the only other place to direct my attack if I can't direct it at your idea? I have to direct it at you. That's why if you don't agree with me, you hate me. No, no, I don't hate you. I just disagree with you. But under the new idea, the new thinking of tolerance, truth and love are pitted against one another as mutually exclusive. Now, we know that's not true. The Bible says speak the truth in love. They are not mutually exclusive, but in a postmodern's mind, they are. So that is, puts us in a little bit of a dilemma. H how do we help people understand that I don't hate you if I disagree with you? So I was in a situation at Purdue where I was up against this. I was invited to speak uh, through the diversity group in the vet school to come do a lecture because on Sunday, uh, uh, they were going to bring in Gene Robinson, the first openly ordained gay bishop in the Episcopalian church. And the Friday before that Sunday, they said, well, we would like to hear opposing views, so let's have Linda Seiler come, the campus pastor for Chi Alpha, and share the Christian view, you know, a different Christian view regarding homosexuality. So I'm, I'm get, I agreed to do it, and then, like, the day before, I was like, what did I just agree to do? <laughs> Lord! So I'm getting ready to walk into this lecture hall of students most of whom are not believers. I mean, I called my intercessors. We're fasting, we're praying. Some of them were planted in the room, you know, and they worked at the university. And, and we're just praying like, oh, God. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting up before these people. I'm thinking, Lord, how in the world? Before I even open my, open my mouth, they're going to hate me. And when I walked in the room, I had pretty good gaydar, so I could tell who some of the gay people were. <laughs> oh, man, if looks could kill. The, oh, man, they were ready. They were ready. And so I was like, oh, how do I start, Lord? And so the Lord said, Linda, start with cupcakes. And he said, just start out this way. Introduce yourself. I'm Linda Seiler. I am a chocolate lover. How many fellow chocolate lovers do we have in the room? We'll do that today. How many fellow chocolate lovers? Oh, yeah, look at the hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if at lunch for dessert, let's say we had chocolate cupcakes and vanilla cupcakes, who, even in the presence of vanilla, would choose chocolate cupcake every time? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. It's always the majority of the hands in the room because we all know chocolate is superior. But how many people, how many people in the presence of chocolate would still choose vanilla? Raise your hands. Oh, wow, look at that. Pastor Phil, I, wow. I do not understand. 
I don't understand. Did they drop you on your head when you were young? <laughs> now, Pastor Phil and I are friends. We're going to be doing a panel discussion tomorrow. Right. Is it possible, even though you and I choose different flavors, could we agree to disagree agreeably and still be friends? I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I did this example when I started things out, and all of us are like, okay, yeah, I mean, you like chocolate, I like vanilla, like that doesn't have to end our friendship kind of thing. And as soon as I did that, the whole room went, oh. <laughs> like they knew where I was going with that. I said, look, I know homosexuality is a little bit more volatile topic than the flavor of cupcake that you like, right? But the reality is, I don't hate you if you believe something different than I do. And what you have to do is take it out of the realm of personal attack and into the realm of ideas. And say things, keep it on, on, in the old definition of tolerance, where disagreement is not denigration. And you have to use what we call the affirmation sandwich. The affirmation sandwich is this. Like, you know, a sandwich, two pieces of bread, and then the middle meat part. You start with affirmation. I love you, man. You're my friend. We're always going to be friends. Right? And then in the middle of the sandwich, you go, but I disagree with the idea that homosexual practice is morally acceptable. Notice how I phrased that. I didn't say I disagree that with your idea. I disagree with the concept, the idea that homosexuality is acceptable. But I still love you, man. You're my friend. Affirmation sandwich. Right? You, you couch it in that language. You love them, but you don't back down and not speak about the truth. You speak the truth in a loving way. In that way, you will disarm that stronghold of tolerance where they try to pit you in the realm of you hate me. You're going, no, I don't hate you. I love you. Now, this idea... I disagree with that idea. I don't even say the words, I disagree with the idea you hold, because then it brings them into it. You have to be very objective about it and bring it back into the real definition of tolerance. Okay, I, I got from, from D.A. Carson. I'm not taking credit for that. I just thought that was genius, okay? Number seven, focus on connecting people to Christ, not stopping them from sinning. Most people think, well, how do you, people are like, well, how do you reach gay people on campus? How do you win them to Christ? Like, well, the same way you reach anybody else that's not gay. <laughs> They're human beings. And you know what? A gay person's greatest problem is not the fact that they practice homosexuality. Right. Yeah. Practicing homosexuality will not send you to hell. Right. What? That sounds blasphemous. Right. Homosexuality will not send you to hell. Tim Keller says it this way. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality won't send you to heaven. It's, it's the issue of whether Jesus is on the throne of your heart or not. Amen. The reason you practice homosexuality is because Jesus is not on the throne of your heart. That's the root issue. Amen. And so focus on connecting them to Jesus and the gospel. Who cares whether they're practicing homosexuality, they're drinking, they're fornicating, whatever it is that they're doing. We don't do that for any other sin. Well, you need to stop being an alcoholic before I can lead you to Jesus. No. Connect them to Christ. I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will start taking care of everything else in their heart. You also need to realize that they are among the most lonely people. When you are gay identified, you're very lonely. A lot of these students, they will go home, or, or older people, they'll go home, uh, they're at school all day, they're one of the only gay people there, or maybe a handful of gay people, and then they come home to their family, and their family doesn't understand them. It's different even than being like an ethnic minority. Like if you're African American, you might go to a school that's predominantly white, but at least when you go home, you got your family and it's like, I all look, we all look the same and we understand the struggle, whatever. But when you're gay identified, you come out and your family may, may or may not affirm you. It's a very lonely life. And I, I got a real insight as I was talking to the LGBT director at our campus and he was saying, you know, we, a lot of our students can't go home for Thanksgiving and Christmas because their families have disowned them. So they don't do Thanksgiving, they do Friendsgiving. And they say, all the gay people that can't go home and you don't have family, watch come over and we'll all have a Thanksgiving dinner together. What if the church did that? Sometimes the LGBT movement is a greater church than the actual bride of Christ. And we need to be that kind of safe refuge. We're not condoning homosexuality, but we're loving people that are lonely and don't have family. And we're befriending them, right? Number eight. Don't force change on those people who don't want it. There, and Andrew was talking about that. Just don't beat the dead horse. There are people that aren't going to receive it. Don't, don't beat, beat uh, the horse until it dies, right? Don't beat a dead horse. Uh, there are horror stories about people trying, you know, the whole pray away the gay thing. They, they, that's who they think you are when you talk about change is possible and all of that stuff. And you need to be careful how you communicate that. Even on social media, 
We need to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Now, some of you guys are on Facebook and Twitter, and it's just your Christian friends, and you got your own little Christian bubble there, and that's, I mean, be free, right? But some of you guys have, like, public settings like me. I've got friends on there that are, they are gay identified, and we're trying to reach them in the ministry. I have to be very careful what I post without compromising the truth. That's why I just, I make social media social, fun, you know, whatever. Occasionally, when I feel like it's right, I'll, I'll post something. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid to do that, but I don't want to ostracize people uh, unnecessarily. So a few years ago, when they did the whole, like, Chick-fil-A thing, you know, if you love traditional marriage, go to Chick-fil-A. I was at a conference at that time, and we had a break, and we all said, hey, you know, you want to go Chick-fil-A and get uh, milkshakes? Absolutely. Yeah, let's go to Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. I, I'm in favor of traditional mar- marriage, and I love chicken, so everybody wins. So we go to Chick-fil-A. We're standing in line, and I do the little, like, selfie. of a, This isn't the picture, but, like, I did a selfie, and I posted it on a Facebook. I'm like, here we are, Chick-fil-A, you know, whatever. And I immediately get this post from the leader of the non-theist society, that's the atheist, gr- atheist group at Purdue, who I'm friends with on Facebook, who we're reaching out to, who's been to some of our meetings, knows our people, whatever. And he sees me post that, and he posts something really like, rah, 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 on Facebook. And I promptly deleted his comment and deleted him as a friend. And then I was like, what am I doing? How else do I expect him to react? I would be mad too. You know why? Because he couldn't hear my tone of voice. He couldn't see my facial expressions. All he hears is, I hate you, I hate those people, you know. And that's not the heart in which I posted it, but that's what he hears when I post it over social media. And I'm not saying that we don't take a stand on social media and say the things that are true and and there are going to be people who hate us regardless, whatever. But you need to be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as a dove if you've got coworkers on there and people that you're trying to win to Christ you got to be careful as to how you, you communicate those things. And some of those conversations are best had face-to-face, one-on-one, right? Remember when we had the whole, like, the equal sign and, you know, the gay marriage thing, and then somebody came up with the plus sign and God is love. And there were these literal wars breaking out on Facebook. I'm sorry, but posting on Facebook and writing in capital letters <laughs> does not all of a sudden make the pro-gay person go, you know what? Linda's right. I just, I have not seen the light this whole time. But since she posted in capitals and she had a cute little graphic, I have changed my mind. We have to fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. It doesn't mean we don't speak out. It doesn't mean we're ashamed of the truth. But it means we exercise wisdom in how we communicate that truth. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Was he a Facebook friend of sinners? I don't know. Okay, number nine. Don't be discouraged if you don't see results. Sometimes it takes a long time, and the most loud and vocal people that hate you the most are the ones that are, that are under the most conviction. Yeah, yeah. Just keep praying and trusting that the Lord is working. And then number 10, have wisdom regarding gay marriage and attending, you know, students all the time, like, should I attend a gay wedding? Well, a few years ago, I would have said, yeah, I mean, you know, sinners are sinners. Are sinners. They're blind. What do you expect them to do? They're going to sin. And if that's an important event in their life and they're going to go get married, then I should be there at that important event and support them and let them know that for the most important things to you, I'm there for you. And we're forever friends because if you love me and I love you, then you're going to love the message that I stand for. That actually doesn't work, by the way. Uh, but anyway, so a couple years ago, I, I would have said that. And then I read uh, Robert Gagnon's uh, newsletter thing they put out in the Restored Hope Network newsletter a couple years ago. He had a great little art- article on that that in 30 seconds changed my mind. He said this, uh, the Apostle Paul forbade Christians from going to, this is in like 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, he forbid temp- uh, Christians from visiting those temples of idols um, where it was basically like the modern day food court of that time and the Christians eating the food dedicated to idols. He said, you can do it. A lot of you guys are strong enough Christians that you know it's dedicated to an idol, but God is really God and I can pray over it and it's blessed and whatever. But if you partake of that and a younger believer sees you partake of that, they can come away with the conclusion, oh, well, I guess it's okay just to tack Jesus on to the rest of your idol worship, and you don't have to give up your idols, and you can worship Jesus too, and that's okay, because I saw Linda there. I guess it's okay to support gay marriage, because I saw her at a wedding, and that's not my heart. I love the people. I recognize they're sinners, and I don't believe in this, but if I'm there participating, somebody else can see what I'm doing and come away with a wrong conclusion that I never intended to send, right? The other thing is the Apostle Paul says there are spiritual forces at work and you can't drink of the cup of demons and the cup of the Lord at the same time. 
And we are unwittingly in, in, un, strengthening the stronghold of homosexuality if we start attending gay weddings and saying this is a good thing. I mean, think about what a wedding is. It's a public covenant, and they used to say, if anybody is against this public covenant, speak now or forever hold your peace. That's the purpose of a wedding, where we all come together and say, this is a good covenant in the eyes of God. I can't in good conscience attend a gay wedding. And, and do, it's not a good thing in the eyes of God. Now, that's a hard thing because a lot of us will be like, well, you know, if, if I don't attend it, my friend will hate me. They'll interpret that as a really painful thing, especially if it's a family member. That's between you and the Lord. You've got to figure out what the right thing is to do in that situation. But there is a way to communicate to somebody, hey, you know I follow Jesus. You know this is contrary to what the Bible teaches. I love you, but I cannot support this kind of of a marriage. It's, it's not okay in the eyes of God. That violates my conscience, and I will worship God more than I worship your praise of me. I mean, you don't say that to them. You know what I'm saying, right? And there's a, there's a way to communicate that in such a way. And you know what? Unbelievers actually expect you to hold fast to your conscience. And when Christians don't, you're just watering down the gospel anyway. You're not doing anybody a favor. But persecution is going to come, my friends, and it's going to be hard. I love what Robert Gagnon said at the end of his article. He said this, what good would I be anyway? at a gay wedding, since I would be visibly weeping my heart out at a ceremony that solemnizes a behavior that puts a loved one at risk of not inheriting God's kingdom. Isn't that amazing? And I thought, yeah, of course. Why would I do that? What in the world am I celebrating? And we say, oh, but I'll lose the platform to reach out to my gay friend if I don't celebrate. You know what? Jesus reached out to sinners without going to things that compromised the faith right? He didn't, he didn't go to things where they're celebrating immorality and, and stuff that was contrary and, and forcing us, him, to celebrate those things. He hung out with sinners and tax collectors, yes, but he wasn't going to practicing temple prostitution and other things that were going around him. No, no, he was separate from those things. So Gagnon closes his article and says, I don't think Jesus would attend a gay wedding unless it was to call everybody to repentance. But we're scared to do that, because of the, the stronghold that's sweeping across our land. And I get it. I faced the same thing at Purdue. I was asked a couple years ago, would you speak at this, this public forum and explain whether or not people are born gay and we're going to invite the whole campus and, and you know, the gay community could be there, whatever. And I thought, we're going to get kicked off campus if I do that. I don't want to do it. So when they asked me to do it, I said, well, I gave the typical Christian answer. I'll, I'll pray about it. Which basically means I'm going to find a way to finagle my way out of this <laughs> and put the blame on God. So, so we're, we did pray about it. And so we're at a prayer meeting and one of our staff members sees a tornado in the spirit. And she goes, I see this tornado. And I don't know what it means. So we're like, okay, Lord, what does the tornado mean? And this is what the Lord said. He said, Linda, when you see a tornado, what's your, your gut reaction? Right. Take shelter, run, hide, preserve your life. Naturally. That's what the Holy Spirit said. There's a stronghold of homosexuality that is sweeping across this land like a tornado at breakneck speed. And you know what my people are doing? They're running and they're taking cover and they're hiding. And if you do that, you are unwittingly strengthening the very stronghold you say that you resist. It is time to speak up. We must do it in compassionately, but we cannot. We have to toe the line. We cannot give up. And we must speak out. We can't be afraid of persecution. In fact, in Acts chapter 3, remember when they went to the, the, gate, the man at the gate called Beautiful and they, he was healed, instantly healed. And then uh, Peter and John get in trouble for that and they're pulled before the authorities and they command them not to teach or preach at all in the name of Jesus ever again. Don't you do that. And they said, oh, sorry. Well, we can't help but speak about the things we've seen and heard. And then they went back to their people I lost my battery. Oh, there it is. You would think uh, by the way we respond today, we would have gone back to our own people and been like, oh, man, they told us not to speak up anymore. It's getting really bad out there. It's the scandal scandalization of the good news, and our good news is now bad news. And you know what? Let's just stay in our holy huddle and ask God to protect us and try not to rock the boat. That's what we're doing right now. And that's not what they did in Acts chapter 4. Do you know what they did? John and Peter went back to the group, reported to, what to them what happened, and they're like, hey, guys, you know what? They told us not to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Yeah. First words out of their mouth. Sovereign God. Yes. You're sovereign over this stronghold and all the stuff that's going down in our land. They're only doing what your power and will decided in advance to do anyway. 
So we ask you to stretch out your hand, perform signs and wonders, do it again. Heal more people just like that. Make them more mad. And give us boldness to preach your gospel. My friends, that should be our response. Persecution should drive us to our knees and drive us to say, Sovereign Lord. He's not surprised by what's going on in 2016. He's not confused by the postmodern, post-Christian mindset. We can seek him for wisdom inspired by the Holy Spirit as to how we can demonstrate compassion without compromising the truth. Amen? Amen. 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 We, Carol, has an evaluation that she is going to hand out to you guys. So if you would stay here and fill out the evaluation, that will help the, the conference planners know what to do in the future. And when you're done with the evaluation, lunch, I think, is out in the gym. So thank you very much for coming.